what we want to do with um, Parkinson's is to stop the disease in its tracks and prevent it from progressing. And one thing I would stress is that Parkinson's is a very variable condition. So some people are affected quite mildly and the disease remains relatively stable. Some people develop more problems much more quickly. There's variation between people with Parkinson's, which we don't fully understand. But on average, Parkinson's gets worse with time. And there, there, there are different ways of measuring this. This is from a paradigm that's been used for a lot of clinical trials over the years, which is actually taking people who are first diagnosed with Parkinson's, who don't need to have any treatment, and see how long it is before they need to start treatment to help to control their symptoms. And of course, if you follow up these, um, if you follow up these patients over time, then as time goes on, they'll gradually need to start treatment. And, and by sort of three or four years, almost everybody will be on some treatment. So the question is, can you stop this process in its tracks? And can you actually uh, hold people at a state where their symptoms are so mild that they don't need to take treatment? That's our, that's our mission. That's our, uh, that's our aim as researchers, is to try to hold things so that people don't need to take any treatment for Parkinson's and the disease is effectively held at a very mild state. Unfortunately, that there have been at least 20 trials of what we'd call disease-modifying therapies, things like vitamin E, uh, coenzyme Q10, um, various other factors. And in fact, none of them have been able to um, halt the disease in its tracks. So if you compare what happens to people with no active treatment at all, placebo, to people with these potential therapies. No, none of them have shown any difference between placebo and, uh, and the, the active um, treatment. And just to, just to emphasize again, obviously um, people with Parkinson's other conditions are very keen to take treatments or potential therapies that might be helpful for this condition. The only way we can really evaluate whether or not they are effective and whether the potential treatment is helpful or harmful is to conduct a randomized trial where half of the people go into a placebo or a, a dummy arm and half go into the active arm. It's very difficult uh, in any other way to determine whether a treatment is going to be helpful or harmful and really we need to develop the best evidence we can for Parkinson's patients. So these trials to date have been ineffective. There are probably several reasons why we haven't got there yet in terms of a treatment that can hold things in its tracks. One of them may be incomplete understanding of the mechanism. Through genetics, we understand much more about the, um, about the disease mechanisms. The other thing which I, think, um, which I think is extremely important is I think that we've made an error in lumping all Parkinson's patients together as having the same type of disease. I think it's much more likely that there are different types of Parkinson's that are likely to, form, uh, that like to respond to different treatments. So I know that Alison Noyce, I think, and Michelle Hugh last year talked about personalised medicine, stratified medicine, very much from a clinical standpoint. Um, for, for John and myself and, and our colleagues in our sort of area of research, what we're really interested in is genetic subtypes of Parkinson's. So a future where we'll be able to take people's blood samples and predict what treatments they're going to respond to and have better designed trials where we subdivide people in terms of the mechanism that's most important for their illness and target that mechanism with treatment. And we're actually now starting to do this. So we talked about Parkin, which is a gene uh, for early onset Parkinson's disease. It's a relatively rare gene, but it, it particularly affects the energy supply for nerve cells, so mitochondria. And we are about to start a study of a drug which boosts mitochondrial function. It's being um, uh, led by Edison Pharmaceuticals, in which we're specifically going to recruit patients who have this type of mitochondrial problem, because we know what the problem is in those patients, and so they're the first people we should start with to see if we can improve, that, improve the situation. So in fact, other mitochondrial disease uh, treatments have been tried, like coenzyme Q10, but they've been given to all Parkinson's patients. And in fact, it may be that if we'd picked the right patients, it would have been effective. So this idea of getting the right treatment to the right patient, I think, is absolutely key to the approach. So Parkin is one disease, um, another, uh, one, uh, one gene, another gene which is being pursued very aggressively now at the Royal Free Hospital. Tony Shapiro and his research team is the GBA gene, which is involved in the waste production in nerve cells. And there's a drug called Ambroxol, which seems to be effective for this. And I think we're quite close to uh, being in a position where there's going to be treatment trials directed on this specific genetically driven mechanism. And the third gene is this LRRK2, LERP2 gene. 
um, which is a, a kinase within nerve cells which um, phosphorylates uh, other proteins within the cell. And actually, there's a big drive to develop drugs which actually will prevent that kinase activity and provide a treatment for people who carry that gene variant and perhaps other patients with Parkinson's as well based on their, based on their genetic makeup. So I think we're at the threshold of genetically driven trials in Parkinson's. What do we need to take this forward? Well, one of the things we do need is very, very large groups of patients who've been genetically characterised. So um, uh, thanks in very large part to Parkinson's UK's funding and support, we have, we're developing very large cohorts of Parkinson's patients with genetic characterization in the UK. So the um, tracking Parkinson's study led by, led by Donald Grosset in Glasgow, 75 UK centres, uh, 2,249 Parkinson's patients are included in that. And that's really a fantastic resource distributed across the country that enables us to have a head start and to push forward with some of these studies. The Oxford Parkinson's cohort led by Michelle Hugh is another large cohort uh, based in Oxford running along similar lines and working closely with the tracking Parkinson's cohort in terms of developing these patients. John alluded to identifying people early in the disease course. So Alison Noyce at UCL is leading this PREDICT PD cohort which is, which is aimed at picking up patients in the very earliest stages of disease uh, uh, who, who may be amenable to different types of treatment to patients uh, with established disease. So we're talking about at the moment at least 5,000 people in the UK who have come, who have volunteered, so people with Parkinson's, people unaffected by Parkinson's. Of course, this research is crucially dependent on patients, you know, generously giving up their time, agreeing to be involved in research and contributing to the research effort by being research participants. And of course, the funding and support of Parkinson's UK, uh, together with uh, the NHS support in terms of uh, research support that we have to develop these cohorts. So we really need to have these large cohorts to enable us to deliver these large trials in the future. Um, I think in terms of what's happening with genetic research, I've mentioned how cheap it is to generate all the genetic data. How do we make sense of that? Well, in fact, coming back to this audience, if we were to take blood samples, analyze their genetic makeup, we would identify in each individual about 5,000 variants that actually would affect proteins in some way. So each individual would contain 5,000 uh, 5, variants. We're interested in rare variants that haven't been seen in other people or uh, are not common variants in the population. And in fact, the people in here, each individual in here, will probably carry about 500 rare variants that may never have been seen in uh, other individuals around the world. They're extremely rare and may be relevant to the disease process. How do we make sense of that? And that, although it's very easy now to generate the data, actually making sense of the data is very difficult. Actually interpreting the data and understanding what, what might be important for the disease is, 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 is very difficult. One of the ways from the genetic standpoint to do this is to study families and to look at people who are affected by Parkinson's together with their relatives uh, who are not affected, look at all the variants they uh, carry. They're likely to carry a lot of similar variants because they're related and we can subtract that information to try to pick out the variants that are relative to, Parkins relative, relevant to Parkinson's. So we've set up a pilot project called Parkinson's Family Project which is particularly um, targeting patients or looking to recruit patients with very early onset or familial Parkinson's together with other family members so we can subtract the genetic information and home down on the um, variants that are relevant to the disease. We're also with Parkinson's UK funding engaging with the Genomics England project, the 100,000 Genomes project. So you may have seen this in the newspapers. So this is looking at 50,000 pe people with rare diseases and um, 25,000 people with cancer. So those, those patients have two genomes sequenced. And the rare diseases um, group, we've made the case that actually to develop Parkinson's in your 20s or to have lots of people in the family affected by Parkinson's is a rare disease. So we've argued this should be included in the government's effort. And so the government are funding sequencing of the whole genome together with a collection of a lot of information and with the help of Parkinson's UK, we're going to look to recruit patients with Parkinson's to that study to be part of that, um, to be part of that nationwide uh, effort to um, accelerate and develop Parkinson's research. And in fact, um, the gentleman in the, the picture, one is affected by Parkinson's, one isn't, they're brothers. The question is what's different between them that, um, that has meant that one person's gone to develop Parkinson's 
and the other hasn't. If we understood that, then that would really take us forward in terms of um, the disease process and developing new treatments. So um, I think what we've done in the um, talk is to talk about um, uh, things starting with the patient and using um, the you know, co collaborating, cooperating with patients to make um, discoveries about what the um, basic cause of the disease is, using that to develop models that might be cell models or animal models or protein models that we can use to try hundreds and thousands of potential treatments to pick out treatments in a, in a laboratory setting that might be relevant to um, Parkinson's patients. They, ne they, they then need to be taken forward to clinical trials to actually evaluate in patients whether the treatments are um, safe and effective, and of course then to take things back to the patient to develop new treatments for patients with Parkinson's. This is our mission, this is our sort of manifesto for what we hope to do with genetics research in Parkinson's. In a typical day for me, I'll see 16 people with Parkinson's during my clinic and I'm still amazed at the difference from one person to the next. So how do we start to appreciate some of these individual striking differences from one person to the next with Parkinson's? Parkinson's is a disease where the average age of onset is in the 60s. If you're someone who's developed Parkinson's in your 20s, that's a very unusual thing to happen and we're particularly interested in why that might have happened.